In this video, I'm gonna go over solutions to the uh, variables exercise. So I'll go ahead and open that up. I'm gonna click anywhere in this top section up here. It doesn't really matter where I click, just as long as that top section is selected. You can see which section is selected by looking at this blue bar over here on the left. So you see this blue bar on the top. If I click down below, the section below it is selected. And so if I do Control Enter while this is selected, it'll run the code. I mean, currently just a CLC, but it'll run the code in this section but I want to run all my formatting first just to clear everything back to a blank slate and make sure I'm using the formatting that I want. This formatting will carry forward through the rest of the document until it's changed, if it's changed at any other point. So control enter and the first set of instructions here opens zero to MATLAB on page 15. Uh, you may need to download it and that link is provided. As with all these exercises, I strongly encourage you to attempt all of them on your own first before looking at these solutions. Uh, that's how you get better at MATLAB, by writing the actual code yourself, trying it, running it, fixing it, uh, and, and learning the things that you need to learn through those processes. I've already got zero MATLAB open right here. I'm going to click up top and type in 15 and hit enter. All right, now we're on page 15. All right, so not these ones at the top, which you could also do for practice, but these square root expressions right here. One thing that you can do that I'm going to show you right now is if you're on a Windows machine, Windows key and then left or right arrow to put uh, one of the windows on the left half of your screen, and then you can select whatever you want on the right half of your screen. Now this a little bit screws up like with my command window, so I'm gonna resize things slightly, and it's still not gonna fit great, but now I can see my uh, expressions over here, and I can see MATLAB over on the right, and this will make it easier for me to copy these down. Again, that's Windows. You hold the Windows key and then you press the left or right arrow to move your currently focused screen onto the left half or the right half. All right, square root of four, SQRT parentheses four, square root of nine, SQRT parentheses nine, three plus the square root of two over seven, three plus the square root of two over seven. Now it would be wrong to just do a divide by seven. I need to make sure that I use parentheses to indicate that that whole numerator should be grouped that whole thing should be divided by seven right there. Next one's quite a bit more complicated. Two times 3.1 raised to the 2.1 power plus the square root of two divided by, and all of that needs to be the numerator. Blank spaces don't matter too much. So I'm gonna put blank spaces around the division sign. And then I'm gonna group up the denominator as well, which is always a uh, safe choice, I would say, plus seven. Great. I'm actually gonna get rid of those spaces. Okay, so let me scroll to the right on zero to MATLAB and then let's run this and check our answers. So control enter to run that code. I'm gonna change the window size so I can see my command window and those numbers all line up. So that worked great. All right, now I'm gonna go back to full screen. I'm just gonna click the full screen button right here and full screen my MATLAB. And if I wanna get rid of these little orange warnings, I could put display around each of these which I can relatively quickly do. So I will just go ahead and do that. Rounding functions. Write code to answer the following questions about rounding. Does the round function, round up, uh, it's off the screen slightly, or down, given 2.5 as input? So the question is, is this gonna be three or is this gonna be two? The answer is three. Does ceiling round negative numbers closer to zero or further away? So let's try the ceiling of, and we might wanna try a few different things. So let's try like negative 1.1, uh, and then also try uh, negative 2.9. So something that's close to, in this case, one, something that's closer to three, how do these get rounded? So let's run it. All right, so negative 1.1 gets rounded to negative one, and negative 2.9 gets rounded to negative two. Both of these are closer to zero than the, the initial negative number. So the answer is closer to zero for this one. What ceiling does is if you imagine your number line vertically, positive numbers at the top, like if you, you'd count down like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way to zero in the middle, and then down your negative numbers, negative one, negative two, and so on downward, ceiling always rounds up that number line. Does floor round negative numbers closer to zero or further away? The question is slightly cut off. And what we can do is we can copy this down and just change it to floor. I just double click on the word and it selects the whole word. 
or I can use control shift and then an arrow key to just grab the whole word. And as we can see here with those last two results, floor is going to round negative numbers further away from zero. Again, if we imagine that vertical number line, floor rounds down that vertical number line. Write a line of code to round pi to three decimal places. To round some number, let's call it x, to three decimal places, we would say round parentheses x comma three, except I want to round pi. Now pi, thankfully, is built in to MATLAB, so I could just type in pi right there and run it, and there is pi to three decimal places. So as I was writing that, I was a little bit struggling with like the autocomplete right here. I don't actually like the autocomplete. I find it very irritating. So to get rid of that, what you can do is go to uh, preferences. So go to home, preferences, and then automatic completions right there. And you can basically turn off all this stuff. So if you just click enable autocoding, uncheck that. Uh, and then there's other stuff right here, various suggestions. I don't really want suggestions, so I'm gonna uncheck that. Use tab to show suggestions in addition to control plus space. Yeah, I'll leave the rest of these on. These are okay. All right, and then I'll press apply and then okay. All right, did you know that the constant E raised to the I times pi power is negative one? Sounds kind of crazy. Let's write a line of MATLAB code to see for ourselves. To get E, the mathematical constant E, you might think, oh, I can just write E, but that is not correct. In fact, what you need to use is the exp function and raise it to the first power. So exp1 is the same as the mathematical constant E raised to the first power. And that's just a way of getting E. And it's actually a very common thing because very frequently when the mathematical constant E is used, you're raising it to a power. So this is a convenient way to get access to that constant. Now we don't wanna raise it to the first power, we wanna raise it to the i times pi power, which I can actually just copy in right there. i is also built in in MATLAB. Now they would prefer if I write it as one i, uh, and it's the imaginary number. Like literally if I do one i over here in the command window and hit enter, uh, it scrolls off the screen unfortunately, but um, zero plus one i, uh, which I know is not very helpful, but if, for example, we take one i and square it, we should get negative one. And we do, right there. All right, so we wanna see that this is negative one. So let's run it. Now, we get a little bit of a weird result. We get negative one plus whatever the heck this is. But what this is, is basically a rounding error. MATLAB cannot perfectly represent pi because pi's decimal places go on and on and on and on forever. So it has to estimate to some degree. Now that can cause inaccuracies in our results. For example, here, what we have is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 16th power. So a decimal place, 15 zeros, and then a one, a very, very, very small number multiplied by i, the imaginary number. So very, very close to negative one. Now, as you'll see in the instructions here, I basically say what I just said there, since computers can't perfectly represent numbers like E or pi. Yeah, so there's also inaccuracy in E itself. There's a rounding error, which we can prevent by using the round function. So let's now do that. So then we can say round this right here. And we don't even need to tell it how many decimal places because the default is no decimal places. And we can run it. And now, again, it's off the screen slightly. There's our original and there's our rounded solution. Great create a variable named val and set it equal to 49. Val equals 49. I know this seems very simple, but I'm just trying to get folks in the habit of what does it mean to create a variable with a particular name? You put the name on the left, you have an equal sign, you put the value on the right side, and you can suppress the output with a semicolon if you want. That's a bit of extra. The question didn't really tell you to do that, but this would be a nice complete solution, and it will display out 49 when we run it. The spaces right here are optional. I put them in uh, because I think it looks nice and organized. The semicolon is also optional, right? So if I just run it like this, get val equals 49. Multiple choice. Which option creates a variable named distance and sets it equal to 5.5? Not this one, there's no equal sign. Not this one, the order is switched. 
the variable name, in this case distance, has to go on the left, not on the right. The order does matter. This is not mathematical equals. In mathematics, the equal sign, the order doesn't matter. What goes on the right side or the left side, you can swap them. But it does matter in programming because we're not asking about mathematical equivalence. We're not making a statement about mathematical equivalence. What we're doing is we're putting information into a memory location, a computer memory location that has a name, and we're giving it a name of distance. D is the correct answer right here. It's very important that you understand this equal sign is not mathematical equals. I think a good word for this equal sign is put. Put 5.5 into a box labeled distance. The following code converts 70 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. Write code below the given code to change temperature back to Fahrenheit by setting the variable equal to itself, multiplied by 9 fifths, and then adding 32. All right, so we have our temperature variable, 70 degrees Fahrenheit right there. This comment is labeling what units that temperature is in. Strongly encourage you to do that with your comments. I display it out. I make the conversion calculation right here. I just looked this up online, and then I display the result. I've labeled the new calculated result as units Celsius, and now we need to do the other conversion. So what I want is, I want my new temperature to be, to get the value, I want to put into this temperature variable, basically the inverse of this calculation right here. So the last thing that I did in this calculation was I multiplied by 5 ninths. So the first thing that I want to do here is take temperature and multiply by 9 fifths. So the inverse there. And then the first thing I did in this calculation was I subtracted 32 because it was inside the parentheses. The last thing that I want to do is I want to add 32 to get back to where I started. And I'll even change my display here to say copy this word here because Fahrenheit's a hard word to type out. I'm going to display Fahrenheit inside of little single quotes or apostrophes and then I will display the temperature itself. There's a big difference between displaying something in single quotes or just displaying it without them. You can see in the color coding that this is pink. Uh, it's literally going to print out this text whereas for the variable it's going to print out the information inside of the variable. Let's go ahead and run this. All right. So our original was 70, converted to Celsius. It's now this 21.111. And then back to Fahrenheit, and it successfully got that 70 value. That's how we can check our work and know that we did the uh, conversion backwards from Celsius to Fahrenheit correctly. If you're curious about this weird indentation here, yeah, so am I. MATLAB indents numbers with decimal places more than it indents whole numbers and integers. I don't know why it chooses to do that, but it does. Challenge. Find the amount of matter necessary to produce the amount of energy radiated by the sun every day. This is the information we're given. Step 1. Create a variable named energy and set it equal to 385 times 10 to the 24th power. So energy equals 385 times 10 to the 24th power. I strongly encourage you to use the variable name energy rather than E because E could stand for a lot of different things. We want to make our code easy to read. And that means using variable names that are words that we can read and understand some of what the context is. There are a variety of different ways to express 385 times 10 to the 24th, but this is the way that I'm going to do it for this problem. Create a variable named light speed and set it equal to 300 million. Okay, so light speed equals now 300 million, one, two, three more zeros, one, two, three more zeros after that, is a little bit hard to write and a little bit hard to read. And it is wrong to put in commas. This does not do what you want. The, you know, sort of orange warnings there are a sign that something has gone wrong. So one thing you can do is just write it without the commas, but a better thing you can do is write it in the same notation as this sort of thing up here, except we're not gonna use the plus sign. So basically saying, okay, this is eight total zeros. So, and you can sort of count that more easily with the commas, eight total zeros there. So what we can do is we can write it as three E eight, which is the exact same thing. And I would add in a comment 
especially if you're a little unsure of yourself with that sort of thing, explaining to yourself, okay, what exactly is this right here? Now I am getting little warnings because I'm not suppressing my output on all of these. And that's just what I'm gonna do for this for now because I'm gonna be a little bit lazy and just kind of go through it relatively quickly. If I wanted to get rid of the warnings, I could put semicolons in to uh, suppress my output. Basically make it so that nothing displays over here. But that's not what I wanna do. By the way, this is displaying over here because I, I cut out of the video where I wrote up a incorrect solution to this. So I should erase that, there you go. Anyway, don't worry about that. All right, so this is what we got so far, let's run it. Okay, there's our results so far, great. This one's in scientific notation, this one's not, that's fine. That's based on the format that we're using. Remember, we're using that format short g, which is defined at the very top of our MATLAB document. Step three, convert joules per second to joules per day by setting energy equal to its previous value multiplied by 3,600 seconds per hour and 24 hours per day. Okay, so we've got energy, but it's currently in joules per second. So we wanna convert it to what? energy times 3,600 times 24. All right, so there's our new energy value. This is a little bit of a weird looking thing. You won't see this in math class because this equal sign is not the same as the equal sign in math class. This equal sign is saying, put the results of this calculation on the right into the box named energy on the left and replace the previous value in that box. So here, what's our current energy value? Well, it's whatever this number is up here. And then multiply that by 3600 and multiply that by 24, whatever that new result is, that replaces the old value of energy in this variable here. Continuing on down, use algebra to solve for mass in the following equation right here. Now, you could do this on paper. I'm gonna just kind of type it out in front of you. Basically, what I'm going to do is divide both sides by light speed squared. So then what I end up with is energy divided by light speed squared equals mass. Now, in terms of mathematics, mathematical equations, the right and left side are interchangeable. That's what equality means. So I can put the mass on the left side and the energy divided by light speed squared on the right side. I don't want to run all this MATLAB code. I only want to run the last one. I was just showing the algebraic manipulation steps, which like you could just do on paper. I'm basically just solving for mass, which by the way, MATLAB can do for you, but that is a much later part of this course and a much later video that I'll eventually get to. All right, there we go. Let's run it and see. The sun converts 3.7 roughly times 10 to the 14th power kilograms of matter to energy every day. It's a lot. All right, and that is in fact what we ended up with, so great. Oh, and we display it out right here. So this is just showing some more displays, uh, how to display out that text using the apostrophes, the single quotes, and then displaying out the variable value without single quotes, which is important. Okay, a multiple choice as I scroll down here. Velocity v equals initial velocity which uh, I'm gonna write as V0, but would typically be pronounced as V0, plus acceleration, A, times time, T, or this equation right here. Solve for A in the previous equation. Which of the following is your result? This is an algebra question, not a MATLAB question. The reason I put this at all in this exercise and in my course is this is a gut check. If you don't know how to do this, uh, you need to talk to me as an instructor, and you probably need to drop the course and take a, a math course instead, okay? So YouTube, I know this is probably not relevant to you, but maybe it is. Uh, so if you cannot do this question, you don't wanna proceed with this course until you've taken more math courses. So can you solve for A in this? And the way that you would do so is you would first subtract V naught from both sides, and then you would divide both sides by t. And what you would end up with is this right here. And you do need the parentheses. They are absolutely mandatory. It's the quantity v minus v naught, all of it divided by t. That's what a equals. All right, lastly, create variables uh, v naught, t, v. Give each of them an arbitrary value, then calculate and display the acceleration a. So. I'm just gonna do some arbitrary numbers. All 
I'm not really specifying my units, so who the heck knows what any of this means, but it's just, you know, putting it all together just to show that we can. Did I do that right? Yeah. All right, great. So there's just a little example problem. And that's the end of this exercise.